It says it's live. Then we're live. Okay, I'm just looking for waiting for my video, which I can't see you, but that should be it. Hold on. Oh, there we are. Hi, Kat. Hello. I missed you. I know, I missed you too. It's been a few weeks. It has been a few weeks. Um, and I know people are waiting to see like how we talk to teenagers about sex. So about a month ago, we did sort of a general how to talk to kids about sex. And then about two or three weeks ago, we did how to talk to your pre-adolescents about sex. And now we're talking about how to talk to teenagers about sex. And I'm Dr. Bacheva Marcus. And you want to introduce yourself, Kat? Yes. I, I'm Dr. Catherine Dukes. I am a sex therapist and a relationship therapist and also a longtime sex educator and professional trainer. Kat was the um, the educational director at Planned Parenthood in, in, uh, in Delaware for many, many years. And she's always my go-to whenever I have sex education questions. So there you go. So much fun, Kat, because I know everybody's waiting for this because Lord knows nobody wants to talk to their kids about sex when they're teenagers. I know that's so true. I, I believe that we are um, in the last 10 years. I mean, I could be wrong about this because it's anecdotal, but I believe we're in some kind of generational shift where um, parents like desperately want to do better and give more information than their parents gave them. And they have that wish, like, I want to do better. And then they have like no idea what that means or how to do it. So the motivation's there. Exactly. And I think some of that goes back to people's discomfort about talking about sex and especially their discomfort talking to their children. Like you have people who say, oh, I'm totally comfortable talking about sex. I talk to my friends about it, but well, I'm not gonna talk to my kids about it. Like that's some, there's something that seems like some, you're breaking some taboo or something. So we talked about that in the last two lives, how like important it is to kind of get past that and just mm -hmm. go for it. And how not, this is not one conversation. This is not sitting down and talking to your kids, you know, about the birds and the bees when they're 12. This is a conversation that has to happen from the time they're little and you keep talking and you keep talking and they roll their eyes and they hold their ears and they, and you just keep talking, right? You just keep talking because, because the gross factor is not trauma, you know, and, and we believe that information is helpful, not harmful. And so, you know, you're going to make those complex conversations to teenagers about sex so much easier if you start earlier, just saying like, penis and vagina and vulva and anus and scrotum and the whole thing. And right? masturbate. <laughs> yeah, masturbation, everything. But if you didn't do it, it's it's never too late. It's never too late. You can start now. Another thing um, before you start the conversation, because parents have, um, we all like rationalize why we're not going to do things we don't want to do. And we're so smart, right? We always figure out all the reasons we're not going to do what we don't want to do in the first place. But I'll tell you this, I'm just going to get past like two um, big myths or two big resistances. One, parents want to wait till the kid has questions, right? No, don't do that, right? And 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 I, like it's like um, it's like uh, you know, like expecting me to wait for my kids till they feel like doing schoolwork. Like it's it's my responsibility. Or do the dishes. The yeah, to keep that train Ooh. moving, right? It's my responsibility as the parent. If I want them to have a comprehensive sexuality education, it's my responsibility to initiate, not my child's responsibility to initiate it. If they do great opportunity but if they don't initiate it's my job so that's one of the big things do not wait until your kid asks questions the other thing is do not wait until you're comfortable too bad you have to start the conversation anyway tag you, you're it <laughs> yeah do not wait until you're comfortable that's like saying oh i'll start playing the violin when i'm good at it like that's not going to happen. The first time you play the violin, it sounds awful and it feels awkward. And the first time you may talk about sex, if you're talking about it later, it might sound awful and feel weird and feel uncomfortable because in the learning curve, and Brene Brown calls this um, um, effing first try, it, it feels uncomfortable when we try them for the, for the first time. So do not wait until you're comfortable. But here's a really cool secret from a, like as a therapist and as a sex educator, here's what you get to do parents. You get to sit down with your kids to talk about sex. You get to have whatever websites you want to have open, but you get to then say to them, I'm really nervous and awkward about this conversation, but I think it's important. So we're going to try to have it anyway. And my hope is we're going to have several conversations for the rest of our lives about this. So parents, you actually get to say to the kids, like, I'm a little uncomfortable with this, but I think it's really important that we get comfortable. So do not wait till you're comfortable. 
just throw it out there. It loses its power when you say, I'm really uncomfortable. So just throw that out there first, if you are, and get to it. And what's really beautiful about that as an approach is that so many people are uncomfortable talking about sex. And by your saying, like, this is really uncomfortable for me, it makes the kid feel so much more comfortable because the, the kid is feeling so uncomfortable about sex in many con you know aspects, not just with the parents. And so like understanding that adults can be really uncomfortable with it too is so, so important. And what's fascinating to me, Kat, and I feel like maybe because I'm older than you, I sort of remember this better, but I remember that like hearing for years that parents should only answer the questions the kids ask, right? Like that was the philosophy, right? It, don't give the kid more than the kid asks for. And I feel like parents now fall back on that as an excuse to not talk, even though it is so important to use every opportunity. And if you keep your eyes open, there are opportunities abound everywhere. Absolutely. And so your kid has way more blind spots, right, around sexuality and relationships than you do. So if you just wait for them to ask, you're, they're basically asking based on their context, which is like limited experience and limited context. You have so much more information, um, context, knowledge, skills to be able to identify their blind spots. So if you only address questions that they are asking, you're losing out on a very rich tapestry of conversations that are gonna prepare them for situations they don't even know they're about to have. I guess, Lastly, when we're talking kind of about why it's important to talk to your kids, and then maybe we'll move on about what things you should be talking about, especially for parents who are watching are religious or like from more religious backgrounds. If you don't talk to your kids about sex, you don't get to pass along your values, whatever those values are. And you know, you want to be clear about those values. Your kids may adopt those values, may not adopt those values. But if you feel like it's really important to me that my child experiment a lot before they get married, then that's a value. And if you feel like I really don't want my kid to be involved in relationships, you know, physical relationships too much before they're married, that's a value. Or I don't really want my kid to be heavily involved in sex before it's a serious relationship. Whatever those values are, they're your values and you can't expect your child to get those by osmosis. And so the good thing about talking about sex is that you can sort of express what you feel. Like you feel like, I wish that I had had more experience before I settled down. That's an important thing to pass along. Your child may do that, you may talk about it. But if you don't ever talk to your kid, you never get a chance to pass along those values. Mm -mm. How do you lot. feel about that, Kat? I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of like wishing and hoping, I think for the parents like that the, you know, um, that somebody else is like covering these areas. Um, so- uh, Yeah, wishing and hoping, wishing and hoping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but- um, and sorry, what was your question again? I just like, I just lost no, it. No, that I wasn't really a question. I was just sort of saying like, I know, you know, as somebody who works often in the um, more religious communities, you know, <laughs> people get all uptight about it. And I feel like, don't be uptight about it. Think about, but but what's fascinating to me, Kat, is that people just don't, they, they, they sort of think they have their values down. They don't really. Like you start asking them, like, what would you want to say to your child? They're like, well, you know. I'm like, no, actually, I don't know. So why don't you just tell me? And they're like, well, I think, I think, I don't really want them having sex before they're married. I'm like, does that mean you don't want them having intercourse? Do you want them not having oral sex? Do you want them not to be touching? Like, and then they get this puzzled look on their face. Like they haven't really thought about it. Well, I guess I don't really want them touching each other before they're married. Uh-huh, and how about, did you do that? And then a giggle and no, of course not. And I don't really expect it. So I feel like parents need to really sort of talk to themselves and get like a sense of themselves first. Yeah. Also, and thanks for, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that because I got off on a tangent, but there's a difference between facts and values, right? And so um, there's a couple of a couple of pitfalls that parents get into, first of all. Um, either they forget that, um, that, well, they think that, that somebody else is covering the facts, right? And then they think that, oh, they must just know the values. But another thing that pitfalls that parents do is like, they might spout off values as facts as a bunch of shouldn'ts. You shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And you shouldn't do this. And that's just, that's such an incredible, um, there's a wasted opportunity there, there, right? And I think that parents will have more credibility and also have richer conversations if, you're, if they sit down and they say, hey, these are the facts about sexuality, sexual behavior, anatomy, birth control, safer sex. These are all the things that you're gonna need to know 
um, at some point, and I don't expect you to need to know them all now, but I think it's important that you have this information now, right? And even though I'm giving you information about, let's say, birth control and safer sex and things like that, I think every kid should have that because I think that you should have that information when and if you need to make that decision. My values around teen sex are this, 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 this. Yes. But if you make decisions that are not in line with that, I really want to make sure that you have all the information you need to be safe and healthy. And oftentimes parents hesitate to give that message because they're like, oh, but that's a mixed message. But it's really not. Because, and, and actually the research backs up that kids understand the complexity of, the, of that message and it does not in any way impact the credibility of the parent in saying that kind of message of, I really don't want you to have sex until you're ready. I don't want you to have sex till you're an adult. I don't want you to have sex till you're in a long-term partnership or marriage, whatever that value is. But I really think it's important that you have this information about condoms and safer sex and birth control and how to get it and that you have a right to get that. That is actually not the kids. Kids actually get that complex, multi-layered message, and it's not hypocrisy. I love that so much, and I feel like if we say nothing else during this live, I feel like that is the most important thing for us to say because I do feel like parents are afraid if they say if they say I get, if I give my kid information about birth control or consent or how to stay safe that somehow they're going to get the message that I think they should be having sex now, and I really want them to be in college or I want them to be in a you know relationship like a, a serious relationship, and that, that is just not the case. I feel like the kids that I speak with whose parents gave them all the information and then told them what they thought their values, they took it way more seriously because they didn't feel like the, kid, the parent was just like not thinking and just, you know, shoving off information. They felt like the parent was like, oh my God, treating them like an adult. And mm -hmm. I feel like if you get no other message from this entire live series, I feel like that is such an important one. So thank you for clarifying it so well, Kat. But well, now, know, yeah. I was going to say, you know, and, and more um, reason to do that, just one last thing around reason to do that is that, you know, research shows, like research studies have shown that, like, for example, there was a research study on mothers that gave messages and instruction around condoms to daughters before those daughters were sexually active. And another group had given the messages around condoms after those daughters, be after a different set of daughters became sexually active. The thing is, the mothers who gave messages around safer sex to daughters that were not sexually active, those daughters were more likely to use condoms when they became sexually active. But the mothers who spoke to their daughters about condoms after those daughters were sexually active, those daughters did not change the behavior that they had already started. And so here's the thing, you parents, you don't have to think that about this as like, I, if I give my kids you know, information about condoms and safer sex and birth control and sexuality, that means I think they're ready to do it. No, all you have to say is like, this is information that most people will need someday. And I think it's important for you to have and that you're mature enough to understand this information so that you have it when you need it someday. I, I think that you couldn't have said it better. Like, I think that that is just such an important message that we really need to give people. So let's talk about some of the things we want to make sure that parents cover with their kids. And I know that parents watching are thinking like, oh, my school covers a lot of this stuff. But I'm going to tell you, don't leave it to your school. A, because schools don't always do a great job. Not all cat dukes, Planned Parenthood, you know, but also because again, you can't communicate your values while you're doing this. So, um, um, I guess menstruation is like a really important, if you haven't done it already, you really need to talk. Honestly, this is a pre-adolescent thing because most girls at this point are getting the period by the time they're, I think, 11, right? Is that the, a national average or something? Oh, you know what? I don't even know if it's 11, but yes, periods are happening earlier. Menstruation and puberty is happening early, earlier in general. Right, the past right. Decades. And they're all, they're really getting interested in sex. So they're going to start noticing the opposite sex or they may feel bad that they're not noticing the opposite sex because their friends are. And so understanding that kids develop at different times is really important. Right. So there's like, you know, so puberty is already there, like either a little bit there or fully there or just about done, depending on the kid in the teenage years. Right. So you've got kids of like that are, you know, two feet difference that might be, you know, the same age. And, you know, you may have like hormones raging. So something that's very different about this generation right now of middle schoolers and high schoolers and ours is the incredibly vast access to sexual images and information like at a 
moment's notice, like any smartphone, right? Any laptop, right? So it's even more important that parents kind of help dissect some of these messages. But anyway, so typical teenagers- And I'm just gonna throw it out there that Kat and I, the next live we're doing, we're gonna be talking about porn. And I think that if of all the conversations may be the most important conversation, and I think you should tune in for that one because I think that's really like gonna be critical. Go ahead, Kat. Yeah, I'm excited. To, I'm really excited to talk about that one. I just, I just think that there's so many fascinating changes there and there are so many things we can do to like to help with context. So around sexuality um, with teenagers, if you haven't done so already, it's really time to um, make, the me make the messages or give the messages around sexuality beyond sex equals re reproduction and sex equals STDs and unplanned pregnancy. Like you have got to fill that out a little bit. I mean, it sounds like there's no reason to ever have sex unless you wanna have babies, right? Or an STD. So schools, even the best sex ed programs, bet you of it, even the best ones, um, the educators are gonna be hesitant to truly um, talk about pleasure or even acknowledge it, right? right. Um, or, or sexuality's um, ability to like connect or help adults feel intimate and playful and wonderful and joyous. And play. alive and connected to your and essence. Yes. yes. I mean, like sexuality is like amazing, right? It can be so amazing or it can be like, oh, okay. But the, um, the message is like the, the kids are not getting that. And so if you think about all those messages that are missing, from sex ed. And I want you parents to only expect that what they're getting in class is maybe abstinence-based, maybe birth control and condoms, hopefully a bunch of stuff around consent and healthy relationships. And hopefully they got a really heavy dose of anatomy and physiology. I got to tell you, all that together does not make for a really great um, set of knowledge and skills for an adult sexual relationship. There's like a lot missing there, right? And so as parents or trusted adults, it's time to like fill out all that stuff. Don't be scared to fill in or, or ask your kids like, hey, uh, what do you know about like, you know, anatomy? And go to some great websites that we can give you later, like PlannedParenthood.org or Sex Etc. or Scarletine. And figure out if they have that competency, right? So they need anatomy and physiology. They also I have to jump in and tell you yeah. that when my boys were in high school, so, you know, we do these very like lovely formal Shabbat dinners Friday night and uh, they would often have friends over and every once in a while we would talk about sex. They said way too often. So one time we were talking and one of the, the boys, we were talking, I was saying how bad the sex ed is and one of the boys who was in 10th grade or 11th grade said, oh, we had great sex ed class. And I said, oh, really? Did they talk about orgasms? And there was like total silence at the table, total silence. Like they, they didn't even know how to react. And I don't even know if they knew what I was talking about. So you're so right. You know what I'm saying? Like you are so right. When they had sex ed, it was like how not to get pregnant and how not to get STDs. Right, exactly. Like how to avoid these, these, these consequences. And, they, and kids, I mean, kids, teenagers, right? Young adults desperately need all that information. So, but beyond the, beyond the, um, but parents, you should really reinforce like, what they what do they know about condoms? What do they know about birth control? What do they know about abstinence? What do they know about negotiating limits? I mean, uh, teenagers like let's just let's just acknowledge that teenagers experimenting sexually is completely and utterly developmentally normative, and I I have to say my my personal philosophy is I hope that kids and young adults feel like they are in safe, respectful relationships, whether they last 10 minutes or 10 years, but there can be a safe, respectful relationship to kind of experiment about, you know, what does that mean to connect with another human being, to like kiss and touch and everything, right? You know, it's so interesting. I, I, I've watched a couple of TV shows. It's not a great job on consent, but I have to say sex education, which I think is really in a lot of ways a great show, a little kooky, but and a little out there. They do a great job with consent, parents. If you want to watch what good consent should look like. The kids there are all experimenting, excited, interested, and, in, and it's not awkward and it's not wooden. They're just asking each other, is this okay with you? Is this something you want? Yeah. And it's really beautiful to see, but that's not something that I think the last generation got. Yes, exactly. You know what else I love about sex education? And this is something else that parents you should throw in there. Sex is not just penis and vagina. Like it's not, and that actually doesn't even have to be the end all be all for many, many, many couples. And I can't, you know, for the, for the adults that I work with around their sexuality now, I see so many 
issues and challenges and problems that um, really comprehensive sex ed around pleasure and shame and all sorts of stuff could have been prevented like long and long, long, long ago. But penis and vagina is not, doesn't, is not the end all be all or it doesn't have to be of sex. And, you know, especially for parents who ha do have the value that they would rather kids not have intercourse early or mm -hmm. out of a long-term relationship of whatever sort it is. Like the more you talk about sex being a wide range of activities, the more options you give your kids. And, and then you're, I know parents are going, oh my God, I don't want to give my kids options. But the tr truth is you do want to give them options because if they think that the only way they're going to have sex is going to be by getting the penis in their vagina or getting their vagina around a penis, that's A, it's not going to be fun. You know, we, at our center, we, we often joke about seizure sex, like, you know, college sex where, you know, the boy basically puts his penis in the vagina, ejaculates, and he's done. Do you know what I mean? And then that's it. And like, especially for the girls, it's ridiculous. So being able to talk about like what feels good when your body gets touched and how to, you know, and touching yourself and learning how to touch yourself and teaching your partner how to touch yourself, all of that is part of the sex education. Right. And also just reinforcing about, you know, masturbation and knowing your body and like knowing how your body w works, knowing how your body looks. And this is especially for people with, with vulvas, like oftentimes uh, people with vulvas don't really know what their vulva looks like. I had, oh, we had Janice right in at the Institute. And I remember she said, you know, would you recognize your vulva in a lineup? And I was like, huh? And she was talking about how many young women and women don't know what their vulva and, you know, or, and the opening of their vagina looks like and everything looks like downstairs. Like, you know, that how important that is to really get to know your body and really honor that and everything. And so, but I love that question. Would you recognize your vulva in a lineup? Great. It's and amazing. I just imagine like a whole wall of vulvas. Like, it's... oh, that's mine. Or is that, you... that one? Is it that one? Mm-hmm. There was, a, there was another TV show. So I'm doing the TV show. I'm trying to remember what it was called. It was hysterical. The artist, the, re, the really irritating artist was doing, she came, into, the, the protagonist came to see this exhibit and it was the artist had done like all the men's penises. It's just, she had like in mold, she had put in mold up all, she had like mold. Me bag? Yes, yes. <laughs> love that flea bag exactly and it was it wasn't that hysterical the artist had all the molds of all the men's penises who she had slept with over the years yes. it was hysterical anyway sorry we're getting all a little sidetracked there but okay so we've got birth control we've got discussions of consent we've got discussions of pleasure we've got um masturbation we've got um menstruation um mm -hmm. Um, just and a more expansive view of sexuality beyond put this pole in a hole like you know just just a more expansive and flexible view around like you know oftentimes for most women what feels good like for you know for people with clitorises like oftentimes what what feels best is not a pole in a hole you know what I mean like yes not, yes because also, like I love to tell people like the homologous structures like in utero you know we the, the genitalia all at the same for little boys and little girls right until they differentiate right and so the same uh the same homologous structure that makes the labia also makes the scrotum and the same uh tissue that makes the penis makes the clitoris right and so I said if you I, I joke around like if you put that all together expecting women to to um orgasm from penetration in their vagina is like expecting men to orgasm from playing with their trust like their testicles like, right it's like as a whole yes. structure you know and then people are like huh and i'm like you got to think about it though like where's it's this totally right it's to it's so funny because i came up with the exact same analogy but not using that homologous structure i love that that's amazing that is amazing so there's all of these things that have to get covered and luckily there's a lot of resources and i think i will put up a resource page so that's really helpful maybe yeah. Pam and I will put together a resource page yeah so we only have a couple minutes left and there were two other topics i wanted to make sure we covered if not at least briefly so one of them was um, conflicts over dressing, which I hear often with mothers of daughters in particular. God, what a great question. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really worth our talking about a little bit. Um, and also I wanna finish up with what happens when a situation arises where it may not be the situation you wanted to see your kid in, but your kid is in that situation. And how does a parent like prepare for that? So, so let's first talk about the, yeah, first let's talk about the dressing issue. And I'm, 
I'm so curious where you come from on that. I don't know if we, Kat and I did not discuss this in advance. It's one of those few topics it, we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. So I'm so curious where you, you come out and then I'll tell you if I agree or disagree and you'll have a couple points of view here. I know this, I mean, it's such a fascinating discussion. I'm, I'm like a, a proud diehard feminist, right? And, you know, we cannot make dress codes based on, you know, saying like, girl, for example, and this is where we're going, right? So uh, like, uh, I, I think that I, this conflict over dressing, um, I'm, I want to spell it out, is the idea that maybe um, a young woman might be wearing an outfit that may be revealing. Is that, is that what, is that? I think so. The, yeah. the, the mother feels is inappropriate, right? The like is inappropriate. And so if inappropriate the skirt is too short. The shorts are too short. You know, her, 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 her ass is showing out of the shorts, you know, her, her, yeah. your, who knew her new little boobs are starting to show out of the, you yeah. know, the tank top. Right. So this is so tough because, you know, you don't want to say like, you can't wear that because you will cause these violent or sexual reactions in boys. Like that is not the message, right? So we all have to be responsible for our actions. Like nobody gets to assault anybody else just because they think they're very sexy looking, right? We don't, get, we don't get to do that, right? So, so, but, so like, let's just remove that. Let's say that that's not the message that, that we, we've thought about it and that's not the message we want to give because that's like pre-victim blaming. Don't wear that because then you might get raped. Like that's pre-victim blaming. And, and how, do, how can a young person carry that for the rest of their lives? That's awful, right? So, but then there's still that conflict. So there's like, there's a revealing outfit there's budding sexuality. Oh my God, that the ways I used to like rip my own t-shirts. I can't tell you, my, my dad could, did not know what to do with me. I was kind of like a, like a goth kind of punk rock, whatever. And I remember I had like these cutoff jean shorts that were pretty appropriate length, but I clipped like, like thigh high tights and I clipped them to them. So they looked like garters or whatever. And I was wearing my Doc Martin boots and my black lipstick or whatever. My dad's like, I don't think that's appropriate. I said, well, yesterday when I wore these jean shorts without the tights, they were appropriate. So why is me adding tights to them inappropriate? He had no response. He couldn't figure it out. It was okay. I was like, aha. So anyway, but it was like the, these clipped like garters, you know, to my jean shorts looked sexualized, right? And I think that that's the nuance of it. So if we're not saying, hey, you're gonna get raped if you wear that, where do we draw the line? And so one thought I had, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you're saying, Betsheva, is like for a young person, like there's there's um, a, there are more like adult behaviors that your family might value and there might be a more adult dressing that your family might value. Also, you know, when I go to work or when I go on a Zoom where I'm representing myself professionally, like. I'm wearing business casual because that's what's appropriate for the context, right? But when I'm home or doing something else, or if I'm out on a date, I might wear something very, very I might wear something very different. So it's about context. It's about maturity. Um, and I think that it, the family values kind of come in here about what is appropriate. What were your thoughts? I'm really fascinated. It is really, I feel like it's a really complicated complicated issue. I think often what I say to mothers to start with, and it's usually the mothers who, but I think it's the dads also, is the first thing is relax. Just relax because, because, you know, teenage girls are sort of, they're, they're proud of their bodies and you want them to be proud of their bodies. Lord, not like one mother was saying to me, but like, she's like flaunting her body. I'm like, don't you wish that you loved your body enough to flaunt it? Like we have been so beaten down that most women I know don't love their bodies. And so if you can end up with a girl who loves her body, so what if she ended up dressing a little bit more provocatively than you wanted? So that's number one. Number two, and the number two is I feel like mothers are like, oh my God, she's going down this road. My daughter's becoming, you know, they're going to use the word slut. Like my daughter's becoming like, and I just have to laugh because I, and I say to them, just to, again, relax. Like girls are like, they're acting out there, they're practicing. But when I think about the girls who were the like problematic girls, and I'm using that word slut in a really with front, like with quotations, right? Like in high school, the girls that we thought were like really kind of out there doing crazy things. They are not, those women are not walking for you. They are soccer moms now. They are driving the little vans. Their, their kids are right, driving. Like they did not turn into women of the night. Do you know what I mean? Like they just were experimenting. And so a little bit, I think parents have to like relax a little bit. So that's, I think, and I think that goes to the heart of it. Like, yes, your girls will probably dress differently than you want. And, you know, I do think it is your right as a parent to say this kind of dressing just makes me uncomfortable. Well, not it's bad it's not you're not a bad person for wanting it it makes me uncomfortable and when you're with me or when you're with our house or while you're at home I really don't want you wearing 
shorts where I can see your butt. You know, like that just, I don't, that's a respect issue. And as Ken said, like wear it maybe at home if you want. I, I, I do think sometimes parents are also worried that when kids dress too provocatively, they will somehow create a problem. Like, do you know what I mean? Like if they walk out on the street with clothes that are just really low cut, really revealing that they may indeed get a kind of attention that they don't want them to get. Yeah. So I'm not sure how they could navigate that. That's where it gets kind of tricky to me. You know, because I, 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 and I think that all, that's also sort of like, it's kind of a, a complexity of also our culture and um, about like, if you, if you want to wear that, that's absolutely your choice. You know, it's very sexy. It, it reveals a lot. That's really your choice. And when you go outside, it may be that you get attention also for what you're, you're wearing. Um, and, and it's really, really, it's, it's tough also because as women, we've been socialized um, to uh, kind of always be on the lookout for rape. You know what I mean? Like, yes. And, and, and we know like, oh, we have to keep ourselves safe and we shouldn't really drink on dates. And, and you know, and, and people stop short maybe of saying like, you shouldn't wear that, but some people do like you shouldn't or shouldn't wear that. But it's a cultural message that we get. And so I think also the moms, to, the, to your point, Betshafa, I think the moms are also like feeling that cultural message of like, sh you know, she's, we're, this, is, this is dangerous, right? Right. And so there right. can be fear there and attached to a judgment of like, she shouldn't do that. You know, right, I mean, right, it was funny. Right. My, my partner, he said to me like last year, we were just doing funny questions or whatever. And he's like, what if we could switch bodies for a whole day? What's the first thing you would do? And I was like, I would take a walk by myself at night. <laughs> and he's like, what? I was like, I can't do that. I can't do that without being hypervigilant. I can't take a walk of, of any distance by myself at night without being hypervigilant. It's not relaxing because I've been socialized to think that, you know, doing that puts me at risk of being attacked. And it may, it's not crazy. It's not like it's, it's a crazy, crazy thing. It's not crazy. But he so, could not fathom, fathom that. that was one of the first yes. things that I would do. Yes. No, I, I, think, I think you're right. We're dealing with a lot of socialization here. I also think, and this is also an issue which I feel like is tricky to navigate, is that the teenage girls I know who want to dress provocatively like the power that's involved in that. There is a power thing like men women people are admiring my body right I have a beautiful body I feel good about my body and for this moment in time hopefully she feels good about her body maybe we can actually do the magic and have her keep feeling good about her body and there's right. something about there is a power involved in like having people admire you and so you, you know for us to pretend that that's not the case doesn't help anybody and so I think when mothers or fathers can sort of almost Go after that. Say, listen, I know that you have a beautiful body and you are really proud of your beautiful body. And there's part of you that likes to show off your beautiful body. And I don't really blame you for wanting to do that. And then you can add in our family right now, I ask that you don't dress like that, you know, wear it at home for whatever reasons, be they be religious or values. Mm -hmm. Again, it's kind of like the dual message, but I think kids really respect it better if you're really yeah. honest and get to the point and then give them a message. Yeah, like I believe you should be able to wear whatever you want. I believe you should be able to walk outside naked and not get attacked and never have to worry about it. I believe that. Um, but at the same time, when you walk outside, like when you walk outside with that outfit, yeah. um, you have the right to choose that outfit. I, no one should ever take that away from you at all. And because other people are judgy or crappy or whatever or unsafe, they may also give you unwanted attention. Correct. And so let's talk about how to maybe navigate that if that happens. I, so I think in the end, I think if you give those sort of complex messages and you're willing to negotiate a little bit, like, you know, like, like little cat, I don't like your clipping your stockings onto the pants because I was sure it's because I feel like that is very provocative. Mm -hmm. So is there something else that we can do that we can negotiate? How about your, how about you get fishnet stockings with your black boots? And I would sure that did. work better? Sure did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think, you know, I guess what you're getting from me and Kat is that there's no right or wrong answer here. There is being honest with your child, being willing to address all these issues, realizing how complicated it is. And honestly, in the end, try not to worry because your 15 year old will turn to be in 17 and 19 and 20. And at age 23, she's not gonna like, I don't think she's gonna be pushing limits like that. I just don't. If you raised her 
with a comfortable sense of herself, yeah. she'll, she'll start to, you know, she'll start to like figure out herself what she wants to wear. The next thing you know, she'll be like wearing baggy shirts and, and sweats all the time. And like, you'll be like, can you put on something like a little bit cuter? <laughs> <laughs> like we're going out to dinner. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's so, so to raise them with like, try to raise them without that shame and judgment around um, exploration of sexuality and, and exploration around expression, you know, like try to remove like I was trying to be really careful and cautious about how I was saying like, if you go, I was almost said like, if you go outside like that, you might get unwanted attention. But I was like, if you go outside like that, someone might give you unwanted attention. Like I, I wanted to take it off of that person. You know what I mean? Because you have to, yes. I wanted to do it like very shame free. You know what it reminds me of a little bit when we talk about little children and using the correct words and parents are correct and parents are like, oh my God, then they'll be in the supermarket and they'll yell, you know, penis, vagina. And I'll say, okay, so you'll be a little bit embarrassed. Maybe I don't get embarrassed, but you be a little bit embarrassed. But if you're a little bit embarrassed, isn't that better than them having a lifetime of shame around those words? Yeah. And so I'm going to give you the same thing with your teenagers. Even if you're a little embarrassed when you go out with your teenager and she's dressed differently than you think the other moms and other moms are looking at you and judging you because your teenager is wearing like ripped shirts and ripped jeans and super tight. You know what? Better that you get a little bit judged or that you're a little worried about her and that she has a great sense of her body for the long term. Like those are trade-offs that you may have to make. And, mm -hmm. and I promise you, she will not be a sex worker unless she chooses to be a sex worker but she will probably the odds are your daughter will not choose to be a sex worker because of the way she dressed it the way you dressed or didn't dress when she was in high school don't you think that's fair well i think it's fair that you know feeling good about your body and being able to celebrate it and like in a very shame-free way and and even like express people you know express yourself very maybe sexually or provocatively as you're experimenting or growing into a young adult, that in no way should be shamed. And also wanting to express yourself sexual, sexually in like dress or behavior does not in any way mean there's some kind of moral fault in some way or, or some moral lacking. Like right. that, that's like, oh, you know, I mean, experimentation is necessary. Risk-taking is necessary for like a full, well-lived life. And for parents who are particularly nervous, I have seen personally, I'd be curious actually, because you see more teenagers than I do. There doesn't seem in my mind to be a huge correlation between the ones who dress very provocatively and the ones who are more sexual, experimental and active. I do not see a correlation between those two things, even though one would think that would be the case. Do, has that been your experience also? You no, know, I just don't know the research. I don't know the, the data on that, but we no, do. I'm not, but now I'm asking anecdotally, because I, you know, I, now I'm just talking about the, you know, maybe dozen, a few, you know, teenagers I've talked to. I, I'm actually often struck by that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, I the agree girls who come that. in looking like, they come in looking super uber sophisticated mm -hmm. and they don't have much sexual experience. And right. these ones come in looking, you know, the little apple pie, cute, shiny face. Yes. Tons of experience. Like I just, I, that's just like, you know, again, that there's no correlation, not right. to say one is the other. I just feel like it's, a, you can't tell it, you know, that expression, you can't tell a book by its cover. You can't tell you can't. a teenage girl by how she dresses. You just can't. Mm -mm. And also just, you know, as a note that, you know, young women, unfortunately don't have healthy sexual ideals. Like it, it's still a culture of either you're a prude or a slut. And so that's yeah. a hard choice. Right. And so, and also what we know is girls are slut shamed for using birth control, for being sexually assaulted, for what they wear, for what other lies people tell them about them, you know, and, and whether or not they're sexually active. But, pe but girl, young women are slut shamed for so many ridiculous reasons. Or just for people being jealous of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. So. All right, so let's move on to our final topic because yeah. we're way over time. But um, no this, what happens? What happens on that day when you something you find out your kid is having sex when you didn't want them to, or you find out um, your kid has having sex with multiple partners and that worries you? What happens when you come face to face with the reality of your child's behavior and it's not what your values want you wanted in your values? So why don't you start and then I'll jump in. Although yeah. I'm sure you have more to say than I do on well, this. It sounds like, well, it sounds like maybe the parent is, is able to maybe find this out, maybe not in a, a whole verbal confrontation. But if you're finding out right in front of your teen or you're finding out by a note or information you got elsewhere, I think it's really important that you just stop and take a break first. Like go somewhere, 
breathe, think, calm. Because right now, like something has gone wrong. And also you could, um, there's a lot of opportunity to mess this up, right? <clears throat> you're upset, you're fearful, you're disappointed, you're shocked. You can't imagine you're, you know, you still see your 16 year old kid as your eight year old kid. Like this is like far beyond what you ex ever expected for a random Tuesday, right? So I say, take a break, stop, ground yourself. Think about what's going on in here for you and, and how much of it is in here and how much of it is actually over there because most of it's right here, right? Decide what you want your messages to be and decide also what information does that kid need to be able to make the healthiest decisions from here on out? Do they now need an exam? Do they now need birth control? Do they now need a therapist? Do they now need more conversation? Do they now need um, a stash of condoms that's never ending in the linen closet? What do they need? And then come to a place of calm. You could still say, I'm disappointed. This is not what I wanted for you. I'm worried because this, this, and this reason. You can say all that, but do it calmly and make sure you have heavy doses of, because this is now happening, what's so important to me is your health, is your health. And here are the things that you need to make sure that it, as you're doing what you're doing, you can make the healthiest decisions possible because you have access to the equipment, services, people that you need to be healthy. I mean, I think that is just beautiful. And the only thing I would add is something that I think you probably assumed, so you didn't even say it, which is as you take yourself away for a moment, and I think you're 100% right, this is the most important thing, right? The, I feel like the first thing is support and love. If, if you can do it, if you can do it. And if you don't feel like you can, then pull yourself away until you can do that. Because no matter what this kid is saying in front of you, defiant, angry, you know, I'm pregnant, I want to keep the baby. And, you know, or I'm getting mad. We started having sex, I'm planning on getting married, even though we're 15, you know, like whatever is happening in front of you, I promise you that kid is scared and um, confused. And even if it's coming out as anger and the most important, important first piece is I love you I will be here for you and I will help yes. you and I am angry and I am disappointed yes. <laughs> you could say yes. that yes. saying one does not preclude saying the other but I think that um because for exactly what Kat said you have so many opportunities to mess this up and you don't want to mess this up because this is where schisms happen that are not that are take forever to fix. And in two minutes you can cause a rift that may take you years to build back up again and you don't want to do that. Right. And for moms and dads, like if you have those strong feelings and, and you recognize that you need help with that, it's time for you to like talk to your partner, talk to a friend, talk to a therapist, because if your fear is like causing or leading you to like discharge anger on your kid and maybe, you know, cause more of a mess up or a rift in that way, like God, just got to look within, like you deserve support parents on that. You deserve, you know, it, your feelings of anger are valid you know, or disappointment or frustration or fear, all that, that, those are like really big emotions, but yeah, take care of yourself first. So you can, you know, be the best, most supportive parent, like in that moment. And then, then do everything Kat said, which is figure out what that kid needs and give it to them. Yeah. So I broke my own rule and we went 15 minutes over because we always have so much fun talking. We always do. Um, yeah. I know. So um, Kat and I will be back in two weeks um, to talk about pornography yeah. because nobody knows what the hell to do with pornography i can't wait i think we might be going over time i already think we're going to go over time oh my god all right cat and then it's going to be so sad at the end of our series we'll have to think of something else we will we'll think of something else yeah good night good night thank you so much thanks bye, bye.